Hello and welcome to Naive and Dangerous, a podcast about emergent media brought to you by two media researchers. My name is Ted and you can find me on Twitter at Ted Meet you. Hello, my name is Chris and you can find me on Twitter at CL underscore more. All right, so this is our fifth episode uh, for everyone who is listening and this episode is dedicated to war. Uh, an interesting topic to say the least. Uh, we were quite afraid, Chris, that we will not be able to cover it all in uh, one sitting. Let's see how we go. Um, where to begin? Where to begin? Let's begin with the titles. What do we say? So uh, when we were talking about this episode, we were talking about the, the potential of, of the title being war, but in brackets, total and Total War, and that is a, a reference to a video game series. So we're hoping that we'll end up talking about that, but we'll see how we, how we go. Um, I've got a couple of quotes uh, from a, uh, a game, uh, a tabletop game, that made its way into the uh, Total War franchise. Uh, but you've got a couple of quotes first about war, and um, I think we should, we should go through these quotes and then that can help us figure out a title for the episode at the end. Yeah, let's do that. So shall we start with mine? Okay. So my first uh, quote is one by Timur, uh, one of the famous, in, in fact, the last famous Central Asian conqueror, uh, the last um, of the Genghisid dynasty. Uh, the last effort to restore the great Mongol Empire over Eurasia. Um, he lived at the break of the 14th and the 15th century, and uh, he was known as Timur Leng by uh, um, his uh, contemporaries in the West. Uh, Latinized version is Tamer Lane. That's how you might encounter his name. Leng means uh, lame. Uh, because uh, he, as a young man, he had uh, an arrow stuck in his leg during battle and uh, basically he, he uh, could barely walk uh, properly. So anyways, uh, the quote by Timur is, it is better to be on hand with 10 men than absent with 10,000. Such a great quote. Uh, such a great quote, isn't it? Because it, it tells you so much about uh, uh, the fact that it's not about numbers. Uh, it's about uh, uh, being there. And it's about uh, uh, spirit. It's about uh, uh, strength of will and, and uh, willingness to to, um, to to sacrifice. Um, and the second quote is, I, and I wanted to provide an alternative to that uh, Central Asian perspective. So my second quote is from Edward the Third, one of the most famous uh, English kings, uh, the king who began the Hundred Years' War against France and the winner of uh, Chrissy and Poitiers. And uh, it's a famous quote. And it's about uh, the black prince who was the son of Edward III. Uh, and the quote is, let the boy win his spurs. Uh, and so for those of you who are listening and are not aware uh, of uh, the context here, the context is amazing because uh, uh, the quote was uttered during the Battle of Chrissy, which was a, a very critical battle for the Hundred Years' War. Um, the English were heavily outnumbered. And uh, Edward III had uh, given the command of the center to his 15-year-old son. Right? I underscore 15-year-old son, right? The, uh, known as the Black Prince because he wore only black armor. And uh, the English center was very heavily pressed by the French from two different sides, and they were being overrun, literally. Um, and so they needed reinforcements. And one of the Guardians of the Black Prince, who was a, a you know established, very experienced knight. I forgot his name now. Ran back to uh, the reinforcements where the king was, asking for help. And to which Edward III replied, "Let the boy win his spurs," wow. meaning let him prove that he can be a king one day. Right. So prove through bravery and uh, and sacrifice. That's amazing. The the quotes that that I have to share. Uh, are not historical quotes. 
or at least they're not historical quotes in the same way. The, the quotes that I have to share come from the uh, Games Workshop uh, fantasy world of Warhammer. Now, some of our listeners may be familiar with Warhammer 40K, which is the, sci- the, the um, uh, science fiction iteration of this world. But the world that I'm talking about uh, in these quotes is an alternative history, um, an alternative fantasy world. And this is, in a, this is part of the theme of uh, this podcast, which is to talk about the representation of war and how, how war becomes imagined, uh, particularly through games. Can I interject? First Please. of all, I really love the fact that, and this was, uh, for everyone who's listening, this was totally not organized or planned, that I came up with two historical quotes and uh, Chris picked quotes from a, a game environment. And I also wanted to uh, emphasize this, that w- in this podcast, uh, we're kind of looking at war as a, uh, war is history, war is myth, war is play, war is uh, fantasy. Uh, war is a way of understanding the world, of, of understanding um, what it means to be human, understanding uh, what it means for time to be organized in certain ways, space to be organized in certain ways. Anyway, let me, let me get into these quotes. All right. First one, accept your medals, but know this, the true heroes lie still in the marshes of that accursed place. Prince Martin von Christelbach, Elector Count of Stirland, after the victory at Hellfen. Awesome. The second quote, all life consists of highly organized matter governed by the laws of nature. Thus, all life is a struggle against chaos, a struggle that is ultimately destined to be lost. Oh, this is beautiful. Albrecht of Null. Uh, this one is from Chief Engineer Boris Krauss of Null. There are no problems that cannot be solved with cannons. <laughs> and perhaps the, the, um, what uh, fans of... Warhammer Fantasy Battle will be most familiar with, which is the Orc Battle Cry, and I will keep this. Le- I will keep this to a lower left level, so that it won't destroy your eardrums if you're listening on headphones. But you get a sense that this is normally shouted at the top of your lungs uh, in order to um, scare your opponent into submission, and that is Wagger. That's the Orc Battle Cry. Well, uh, and orcs, I mean, we'll get into this, but orcs in the, the fantasy uh, universe are not agents of chaos or cha- agents of order. They are right in the middle. Orcs uh, in Warhammer Fantasy are, fu- are basically sentient fungus uh, that, are, that are, uh, feed on aggression. And the more aggressive they are, the stronger they are. And they start out small and they get more aggressive. And the leader is, of course, the most aggressive. Uh, they are... Um, asexual beings, they reproduce through fu- fungal spores, uh, and so you can never defeat them, you can never eradicate them. They are always a, a force of nature on the balance between order and chaos. Can I just say <clears throat> that uh, I really like the Albrecht of Nuln uh, <laughs> quote, uh, especially this part that uh, all life is a struggle against chaos, a struggle that is ultimately destined to be lost. Uh, it kind of reaches to the core of uh, uh, I think all the quotes that we have thrown here, um, and I am almost verging on on, on going into uh, uh, a tangent here, or, or rather digging really deep into into this. But I think we need to backstep uh, a little bit, and um, maybe let's start with the definition of uh, war or Great. some sort of structure yes. that we can we can use to organize our thoughts and and to make it uh, uh, um, clearer to to listeners. Um, where we're coming from and uh, and to give some sort of base. So how about this? How, how about thinking of war as an evolving phenomenon? For sure. A phenomenon that has changed over history. Right? Everyone would agree with that. Uh, deeply related to technology. Yes. So this is a really interesting uh, insight that um, technology as a sort of uh, uh, stabilization of agency, human agency, uh, has always been uh, very closely related to war, and you could uh, you could almost imagine that uh, scene from uh, 2001, where uh, the um, 
the very primitive to be human um, is uh, uh, using a bone, right, to kill an opponent. And here you have the, the use of technology which humanizes uh, the ape. Love that you mentioned 2001 here because of the scene uh, after the, the ape discovers that he can use the bone uh, in an attack, he hurls it up into the air and then Kubrick then um, transitions the shot from the to spinning spaceship. bone, yeah. not, just a, not just a spaceship, uh, but a uh, satellite, uh, a Star Wars satellite, a, star, a satellite that um, has a laser in it mm. that is designed to bombard the Earth, like it is the ultimate killing technology. It, just to go back again, I found it interesting that you talked about technology as a stabilizing uh, force. My my initial impulse would have been to think of technology as an as an agent of chaos. That this is that 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 uh, technological development splinters uh, time and space and ways of knowing into infinite um, possibilities. See, that's the thing. The, when we think of uh, technology, um, we should probably uh, first be very specific what, what technique is. And I have a specific reading here, awesome. uh, which is uh, um, um, not Heideggerian. And we don't need to go there because we're talking about war. But uh, the, the, to put it very simply, technique is um, uh, agency, stabilized, so it can be used over distance. So when you think of... Uh, um, Right. Uh, someone using a stick to uh, to touch something that they don't want to touch with their hand, the stick acts as an extension of the hand, acts as the agency of the hand stabilized over distance, right? So it can be used at a distance. Um, you could, uh, you could uh, uh, another, another great example that you could uh, imagine here is the speed bump, right? It's a classic example, um, which is, uh, uh, what is the speed bump? It's the agency of the policeman standing there trying to block uh, traffic, which is over a certain speed, right? So, um, again, agency stabilized to act over distance. The problem, or the interesting conundrum, rather, um, because it's not definitely a problem for everyone, is when uh, this agency starts, or rather these agencies in the plural are stacked um, in very complex systems. And they, uh, they are used to act over distance, right? Uh, and because there are so many agencies involved, there are uh, the, the, there is a number of unpredictable developments occurring continuously for which we cannot account. Hence, and that's the chaos. Exactly. Hence the chaotic effect. Absolutely. I, I love the way you described that, um, particularly the, the speed bump. Um, there's a speed bump at, at the university here where there's a, an early child start, uh, centre mm. and there's a speed bump outside of it. But then there's a bus lane. Uh, where the buses can pull over that doesn't have the speed bump. So car, so the speed bump is designed to slow cars down around where children may be, but then there's a lane, so cars will automatically shift into that lane, thus getting closer yeah. to where the kids are. <laughs> so, so I totally agree with you that, that, that the technology is a stabilizing force, but this stabilization then leads into... See, see because there is, a, there is a saying here coming from uh, uh, one of my favorite philosophers, Bruno Latour, uh, which is that technologies are relentlessly moral. And he used it on purpose, obviously. To, to uh, It's a provocative statement when you think about it, but the point he's making is exactly this. That w- they're relentless. And they're, uh, they're relentless because once you put them in place, they will keep enacting the agency that's encoded in them. And they're moral because each of these agencies has a certain effect on reality, uh, uh, moral in the sense of the, the intentional change in reality that has been encoded by the person who developed the technology, right? So they can be they can have uh, uh, profoundly negative effects, right? But they will be relentless. This in, this intentional change of reality, I think, is at the heart of why I'm interested in this topic and the way in which both. Um, war itself, but also the way in which we represent war, whether it's through um, film and te- uh, film and or games or or novels and stories, uh, you know, even myths of valor and things like that represent this, um, th- this, this, you know, I, I guess it's a stabilizing um, uh, imagination of, of war and its effect on us. I agree. I agree in 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 more ways than I can express very quickly. <laughs> but what I, uh, the, the reason I wanted to straight away interject, Chris, is because uh, there is an argument to be made that uh, 
there was a profound uh, paradigmatic shift in, in uh, our understanding of war and uh, in how war uh, be started to be enacted in reality with uh, uh, with the shift from the 18th to the 19th century after the French Revolution specifically uh, and the totalization of the emergence of total war as a concept. So let's go there. Let's do that. Um, and so there is a taxonomy that is used by... Um, uh, uh, military theoreticians and by military academics, and it's uh, it's a taxonomy which uh, uh, argues that uh, there are four generations of warfare uh, that have existed. With the first generation being, um, uh, if you imagine those films uh, uh, depicting you know ancient times or, or medieval battles, usually you have two lines of, of men clashing into each other, right and. Uh, that, that is the first generation of warfare. Two lines of men, they can be pikemen, they can be infantry, they can be cavalry for that matter, but they clash into each other, two, two lines in a, in, in a specific space. Does this generation um, also entail, uh, you know, ancient warfare as yes. well? So we're talking, you know, a- ancient Greek. Ancient thinking... since, since uh, prehistoric times, yeah. up until the second generation of warfare appeared. And that second generation of warfare appeared uh, with what we now call the Napoleonic Wars, and they're actually the extended wars uh, f- of the French Revolution, right? Um, let's let's talk about why those two generations are different. What's so? What defines it's, it's the It's really movement? fascinating. So the first generation of warfare, it, it has many implications. We will start unpacking it on the track in this podcast, hopefully. But uh, what you have there, first of all, is a select group of men, right? So these are warriors. Right, a class. They, exactly. The perfect word. They are class or even better put, they are a caste uh, of uh, people within society whose role is to fight. Professionals. Right? They are professionals and the professionals is, is how we will put it. Yeah, right. They are people who live this. This is their being. A calling. Uh, it, a good word. A calling. It's their calling, right? Uh, on a metaphysical level. Um, of course, there are variations there. You, there. you could find exceptions, but the point is this, that this is a, this is a select group of men. And they, yeah. they, they clash with each other. There is some sort of uh, a trial of strength. And it's when you represent this on a, in, in space time, it's, it happens at a defined time. Uh, usually, it's attacks, it, it, battles usually lasted at most a day. Like it's rare when you have battles lasting two or three days. Very, very rare, in fact. Um, but and these aren't spontaneous. They're, 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 they're marshaled. They're arranged. Yes. They're agreed upon. They're agreed upon. And you have, uh, uh, you know, you have a battlefield. An army tries to occupy a, a preferential position on the battlefield. And uh, the other army either comes and fights or doesn't come. And there is no <laughs> battle then, yeah. right? Um, and this is happening in a very restricted space time, right? Um, and it lasts very short. And you have two lines, I repeat that because it's important for what comes next, two lines clashing and everything is resolved. So when you think of any any warfare from the times of the mythical heroes Achilles and Hector to the times of uh, you know, the 16th and 17th century, right, the colonial wars already is still the same thing. And then comes, yeah. The technologies at this time are pretty well limited, but we are talking about shields, Pikes, shields, pikes, even guns. Even after the guns appear, so what happens the moment uh, um, uh, arquebuses and then muskets right, arrived in the in the yeah, in the 15th and in the 16th century? It's very interesting because you have the appearance of uh, like the phenomenon of the Spanish tercio, where you have a mixture of pikemen and musketeers working together as a unit. Yeah, right. And uh, and uh, but but still two ba- battle lines. Yeah, two, you two. have you have battle lines and you have uh, 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 static. Engagement, yeah, and by by a limited, very limited group of uh, people, and especially with the arrival of the musket in Europe uh, in the 15th and the 16th century, um, those mass uh, uh, or rather large, they were not never mass up until uh, the French Revolution, but the large peasant armies of conscripts disappeared because you needed men who have to be trained in the use of muskets and firearms. So you have the mercenary armies appearing in the, in Europe, right? And the 16th, and especially in the 17th century during the Thirty Years' War, mercenaries acting as, as the warriors uh, uh, of the day. And then uh, the French Revolution shatters this and completely destroys not only the paradigm of warfare, but the, the entire world 
uh, as it was imagined in the lift. And so what happened is that you have the emergence of the mass army. Right? These are the fr French revolutionary armies. First famous battle, Battle of Valmy, which uh, was actually wasn't really that much heavier of a battle, but um, check it out, uh, Battle of Valmy, for everyone listening, uh, V-A-L-M-Y, famous battle because it made a huge impression on one of the most famous uh, military theorists of the time, Clausewitz, who uh, everyone has heard of. If you have heard the, the expression, uh, um, uh, war is politics by other means, right, or the notion, the fog of war. This is all coming from Clausewitz. Little known fact, he was 12 years old when he took part in the Battle of Valmy. He was uh, basically a, a soldier in the Prussian army at that time. So what's the difference between a, a mass army and a marshaled army? So the, the, the mass army, the French revolutionary mass armies were uh, conscript armies. And they were huge. So you have basically everyone all between the, what we now consider normal was considered uh, was considered uh, insane. So you mentioned children, uh, are women part of this army? Uh, no, they were women were not part of this army. They were part of the train, baggage train, right. in terms of uh, uh, logistics. logistics. But uh, so you have uh, um, children, what we now call children, they were not considered children back then. Uh, uh, participating and uh, uh, everyone, let's imagine between the age. How are of, they armed? Uh, everyone was with firearms. Right. And so you have mass drills appearing. And uh, what the other ingredient, apart from the massification, the, the fact that suddenly the French could put uh, 100, 200, 300, 500,000 people in a field at one time, right, uh, is the fact that uh, you had uh, um, a change in tactics. And this is where the genius of Napoleon comes in when he took control over the French revolutionary armies. Yeah, and conquered all of Europe uh, uh, and was finally destroyed uh, in Russia is, is uh, the fact that he used concentrated artillery. Uh, so you have a huge concentration of, of men. Right? You have literally half, half a million people army uh, operating as one um, and uh, a concentration of artillery. Um, and so this is the second generation of warfare appearing with the Napoleonic armies. Uh, mass concentrated attacks by artillery and uh, concentrated infantry units on one specific sector over a gigantic space. These are not anymore the limited battles of uh, uh, literally a few years before, which could be recognizable to someone like Caesar or Alexander the Great. It's, these are radically different battles uh, already. Because of that depth of uh, uh, penetration that Napoleonic armies uh, achieved, and the huge casualties they were ready to take. Like, for example, the French army was, uh, the revolutionary army was able to get, uh, uh, you know, 50,000, 100,000 casualties and still keep going because they were recruiting from the entire population. There was no more select cast of. How's communication managed over this large, you know, when it's a single field, when you have a single you know, unit's flag, semaphore can, can be done. But when you've got 500,000 peasants taking, taking, part of the operation how do you how do you manage that that's a great question uh riders right uh, so horse. with messages and training uh so that uh, uh, a lot of the decision making could be delegated to uh, to trusted uh, generals right um that being said it was still problematic yeah of course because of the, the fog of war phenomenon right um oh that's beautiful because we'll definitely come back and talk about the fog of war and and so what happens then is that, and this is a really interesting phenomenon because uh, uh, it's uh, even to this day is poorly understood by, by uh, the population at large, the effect that the Napoleonic uh, wars, which were actually quite short, they lasted pretty much around 20 years uh, in Europe, um, hit uh, on, the, on world history. Because what happened when Napoleon uh, smashed his way through uh, Prussia and Austro-Hungary, um, and uh, uh, basically became the, uh, the the sole de facto ruler of all of Europe was that there was a profound intellectual uh, uh, shift uh, in Prussia at that time uh, where uh, uh, the military elite, the aristocratic elite, the, the economic elite of the country uh, literally hit a, a sort of metaphorically speaking, uh, a, a gathering and a decision was taken that you know we need to change dramatically in order to be able to meet this new challenge of this new type of war. So 
the modern state appears. That's, yeah. That is the origin of the modern state. The Prussian state is the, the first modern state. So we have modern mass education, a compulsory primary schools, compulsory secondary schools uh, to generate the kind of human who would be able to be effective warrior in a total war army, right? We'll, we'll come back and again uh, talk about uh, the role of games in, in, yeah, we'll, we'll, in that education in a minute. But I want to... Um, uh, get your thoughts on where this second generation um, transforms into the the third generation. So it was the Germans, the, the Prussians, uh, uh, in effect, who who um, made that change, and um, it it occurred as an effect of their thoughts about uh, how uh, Napoleonic warfare can be improved, and uh, it occurred uh, arguably occurred uh, at. Uh, uh, for the first time at the Battle of Sedan, which is 1870, where uh, the Prussians uh, um, definitely defeated uh, um, the uh, descendant uh, um, republic of, of uh, in what was revolutionary France right, and became the dominant power of uh, Europe and unified as a country because until then uh, Germany was a uh, country divided by uh, into uh, a number of small republics, etc. Et so what happened, what the big difference is here is that they... Um, invented maneuver warfare at gigantic scale. Right. So they invented uh, concepts such as uh, uh, deep encirclement, concepts such as uh, uh, um, penetrating an uh, enemy's uh, uh, line at huge scale, uh, penetrating in depth, let's say, over hundreds of kilometers. Remember now, we started first generation, we started with small, basically, football field armies, yeah. right? And, and battlefields, which are like at most a few football fields. Right. Second uh, generation, we're moving Napoleonic arms, which are, uh, you know, you have a front over, let's say, 20, 30 kilometers, maybe 50 kilometers at, at a stretch. And here we're talking already about hundreds upon hundreds of kilometers of, generation. Of, of depth. Right. Movement uh, at, at rapid speed. Coordination, thanks to the newly emergent technology of the telegraph. Uh, coordination and movement uh, due to, the, again, uh, newly, newly spreading technology of the railway. Right? So, for example, um, little known fact, the German um, general staff plans the beginning of the First World War based on the railway um, timetable in uh, France and in Belgium. And they planned it down to the minute, literally based on the timetables and how the trains were moving uh, in order to execute a deeply, deep uh, um, encircling maneuver. Anyways, that's third generation warfare. Uh, mass mobility, and the last time humanity saw third-generation warfare at scale was on the Eastern Front in the Second World War, yeah. where you have you had the two basically the biggest uh, executions of third-generation warfare in practice was the was the Wehrmacht, the Nazi army, and the uh, Soviet Red Army, which both were fighting in the same fighting style, you could say, using the same tactics of uh, mobility and circlement, etc. And ever since the emergence of the atomic bomb. Right, and again, another new technology, the service of war. We've reached uh, uh, what is now called kind of post factum fourth generation warfare, right? Which is probably the most disturbing of all, because um, while third generation is already total war and everyone participates, these are still combatants, right? They are recognized as combatants. There is the idea that there is you have civilian population on the one hand and then combatants on the other. Uh, in fourth generation warfare, everyone is presumed a combatant, right? So you have a uh, um, situation where w warfare is put everywhere and nowhere. It's a uh, um, hybrid warfare, uh, uh, hard to recognize from peacetime. So you, uh, the, the best possible uh, uh, illustration is what is happening in, uh, in Afghanistan or, or in uh, Iraq uh, or in Syria, for that matter, where you have, uh, you know, you could have a peaceful street in a city with people drinking coffee, and then you would have a huge explosion, um, you know, brief uh, shootout, and then and then uh, the fourth generation warfare has disappeared as quickly as it appeared. Terrifying, really. Uh, utterly terrifying. What would, um, what would uh, the next generation look like? I don't know, Chris. Um, too, too scary. It's... it's uh, the interesting thing now is, and I was thinking about this actually early, early this morning when uh, and I was thinking about this podcast and what, where are we going now? This notion of hybrid warfare, 
which is actually um, uh, interestingly enough, it was developed as a, on a written as a paper by the current chief of staff of the Russian uh, forces, General Gerasimov, and it's one of the most discussed, heavily discussed uh, uh, paper in military theory at the moment uh, by um, theoreticians everywhere because he conceptualizes uh, this, this notion of what comes next, uh, a mixture of uh, uh, low-scale targeted uh, uh, real warfare and uh, global-scale uh, permanent uh, fourth-generation warfare. The, um, the, the fourth generation is also talked about as um, existing uh, across m- more than the, the three uh, levels of, of combat, which were you know, typically air, land, and water. The, the fourth generation mm-hmm. is also the cyber um, uh, and possibly even space. So there are, there are five domains of, of warfare in, in the fourth dimension. To, to go back a little bit, where, where does the third transition to the to the fourth? Do you, do you think it's Afghanistan? I, I only ask because um, w- the first Gulf War, for example, was often described as the first video game war. Uh, many of the ways in which the, the the television networks, particularly in the US, but also in Australia, we saw um, mediated for the general public warfare using graphics that were similar to video games at the time. And so video games became an important metaphor for, for communicating to the broader world the, 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 the strategic level of warfare at the same time as reducing the, 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 the graphic content uh, of uh, um, news media coverage of the war that came out of Vietnam, for, for instance. <sighs> It's a it's a it's a good question because probably uh, around the time of the uh, so the, the Vietnam War certainly had elements of the of four generation warfare uh, specifically in the way the Viet Cong was operating in, in southern Vietnam um, but uh, I would say at the second uh, Iraq War 2003 which we saw uh, already a full on illustration of uh, four generation warfare in practice with the way the Iraqi resistance was fighting uh, um, American forces on the ground uh, and in and the situation in Afghanistan, which is basically has been at that level for 20 years already. Yeah. Um, but your point about um, uh, the, the the first war in Iraq is really interesting um, because, uh, you know, we, uh, we remember Boudriard's uh, dictum, right, that the Gulf War never happened or rather did not happen. Um, and, and he said that because of the way it was uh, uh, implanted in the in um, uh, population in the population's uh, minds as a um, screen war, right? As a series of uh, um, almost like video game quality uh, engagements without any of the actual uh, repercussions. Reper- not only repercussions, uh, violence and the, the actual. Uh, um, Grime and, and and destruction, etc., etc., etc. So it was a sanitized, uh, very carefully packaged, commodified war, right? Co- a war as a, a item of consumption. This is this is really interesting because often games which depict war uh, or use strategies that we associate with war or in some way represent elements of war, are often criticised for this sanitization. And, um, you know, we don't see the consequences of the actions that would take place in, in these games. And I think um, that is, is problematic because it shuts down thinking about the relationship between games and war in in much more in-depth and useful ways. Um, yes, of course, the, when we represent war, when we re- represent the actions that are taken in war in a, in a game space, we are sanitizing for, for an effect. But there's something much deeper, something much more profound going on in that relationship. There is a – exactly. Uh, and what is missing is this the, – the, the, the sacrifice involved in war, both willing and un, unwilling, what is, has been so horribly packaged for again for public consumption is collateral damage, yeah. 
right? Uh, it, it's it, this is horror personified this phrase uh, because it uh, obscures uh, um, what is unwilling casualties of someone else's uh, uh, war and. Um, we are working here on the metaphysical. It's, this, this is yeah. a metaphysical problem. The, what, what, is the, what was and what is the metaphysics of war, right? The, the uh, kind of supra-real meaning of war because there, there is a meaning at this level. And uh, there is a... See, one of the things I was thinking about is uh, war has always operated, in, at least in, uh, uh, in a traditional world, the pre-modern world or a non-modern world, if you will, uh, both on two levels, both is a profane uh, exercise of basically the, the, the exercise of violence, but also on a, on a sacred level. Um, as a, um, and, and usually people have the connotation straight away, ah, he's talking about the Crusades. Uh, the Crusades operated at, at that level initially, um, but uh, uh, this notion of war is, uh, is operating also on a sacred level. Has, uh, can be found in all traditional cultures, uh, and that's the level of the heroic. And it's always it always involves uh, uh, personal sacrifice, right? Um, and uh, the achievement of some sort of transcendence through personal sacrifice, um, not not uh, not uh, collateral damage, right, or, or anything like that. So. Um, how how to go? How deep do we go here? Because we can go very deep. Um, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of a few things. Like for example, I'm thinking of uh, uh, there is this dialogue. Uh, it's it's a famous one, and I I highly recommend all our listeners to read uh, uh, the Mahabharata, which is uh, one of the uh, traditional uh, Hindu texts uh, um, in one of the uh, jewels of uh, uh, Indo-European tradition. Um, uh, it's a big book. <laughs> so uh, 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 it's it's uh, it's it's a wonderful story, and um, uh, so this this is the story of the people who ended up becoming the gods of the uh, Indian pantheon, and 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 they were people actually, right? So um, and what's interesting there is that you have this story of Arjuna, uh, is a is a hero, and uh, he's he, and he is on the verge of a huge battle. Uh, and on the other side, so he uh, on the other side, people who he will be fighting are his former friends, and so these are people who um, he he really doesn't want to fight, right? And he's full of doubt, and uh, um, and he's full of fear, and uh, um, um, he he's you know experiencing a, a very low moment just before the battle, and it's it's he's full of fear not so much for his life as for the um, the fact that he is uh, transgressing something by fighting his former friends. And so he has a dialogue with uh, who is, in effect, the god Krishna, uh, who is disguised uh, as a normal person. And so uh, there's this famous dialogue there about, uh, about this battle and in which Krishna tells him basically to simplify it very much that, uh, uh, that uh, this war has uh, both an inner and outer meaning. And the outer meaning is uh, uh, subservient to the inner meaning. That, uh, so it's war has, uh, um, the, the war that Arjuna is fighting is both uh, um, operating on an exoteric and an esoteric level, right? So exoteric is what's happening outside. So this is in terms of the, the, the actual fighting. But uh, he's telling him that you shouldn't, base, I'm paraphrasing, right? You shouldn't worry about the exoteric level. Because it has already been predetermined by the gods, uh, it's out of your hands. Uh, in other terms, um, it is fated, and you li literally, there's nothing you can do to change any of this. So it, you, there's nothing for you to worry about. You should be worrying about the esoteric, which is the inner war, uh, which Krishna tells him is the war against yourself. It sounds very right? similar to Viking mythology. There you go, and and this is the same Indo-European uh, mythological root, you could say. And so um, uh, Krishna tells him that that uh, um, esoteric war is a war against your own fears and against uh, your will to live. Because the, the will to live, that attachment to um, uh, this uh, animal, animalistic nature of life is considered as a weakness, something that prevents you from uh, the attainment of a higher level of uh, realization. 
And uh, in the in the uh, in the Mahabharata, this is called karma yoga. Interestingly enough, so is the the yoga of action, right? So you can, uh, uh, war as a as a, a way of achieving a higher state of being. So this is uh, this is one thing I was thinking about. And the other thing, you can you can find very similar uh, thread in, like you said, you pointed out in Viking mythology. And the way the Vikings viewed uh, um, uh, the experience of the warrior, very often Vikings, for example, would undress and go into battle without any armor because if they are fated to die, they'll die anyway. So what's there to worry about? Uh, like famously, Harold Hardrade at the uh, Battle of Stamford Bridge uh, went into battle without armor um, um, and died. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but that's because he was obviously fated to, to die there. There you go. Yes. And uh, the last Viking, by the way, check it out. Part of uh, Stamford Bridge, 1066. Uh, uh, amazing story. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, and I was thinking about this, I was telling this to my son, the story of Detius Mus, um, which is really fascinating. Uh, now, um, interestingly forgotten, and wh- when, you, uh, when you read or, or encounter the image of the Romans in popular culture, this element of their culture is totally forgotten. So there was a practice in uh, in Rome, and this is the, the Rome of the, the height of the Republic, right? They haven't conquered even uh, all of Italy yet. Uh, the, the war with Carthage haven't even happened yet, right? So this is the, Rep- the Roman Republic at its um, apogeum, if you, if you will. So there was a practice there uh, called devotio, and uh, our word devotion in English mm-hmm. comes from that specific practice. Uh, a devotion means self-offering. Um, and uh, the practice was only in battle. And uh, it involved the commander. Only the commander could do this. No one else, not ordinary soldier. The commander offering himself personally and the enemy as an offering to the gods. And the way this was done was by in the middle of the battle. Usually this was done only when the battle was to be lost by the Romans. So the commander would uh, uh, invoke a special prayer. This this was the devotio prayer in which he prayed to the ancient Roman deities of the underworld and of the earth specifically, the mother, uh, the, the goddess mother of the earth, standing on a spear, and then he would plunge into the enemy line to be killed. Very important that he gets killed. Uh, in which, which act usually served to catalyze to an in, incredible uh, event, uh, level the, the Roman army, and they would win. And so the famous, uh, famous case, Decius Mus, a Roman consul, which the two, the, in the Roman Republic, the consuls were the two rulers of mm-hmm. Rome at the time. So think of it as a president, right? So the, the uh, Roman consul, Decius Mus, in a battle, offered himself, because they were about to lose the battle, offered himself in a devotio, plunged himself to death uh, in, the, in the enemy lines, got killed, and uh, the Romans won that battle. And then his son, and this is where it gets unbelievable, his son was a commander of a Roman army fighting in the same war uh, against another tribe, and they were also about to lose the war, and he also uh, uh, performed a devotio and also got killed. And the uh, and they, they obviously and they also won the battle, and uh, it's amazing to think of a, a generation, an age, an epoch in, in which leaders of people are willing to self-sacrifice uh, to to the higher good, yeah, right, and uh, uh, offering themselves as an offering to to uh, to the gods. That seems so strange. It's to strange us now. to us. It's, yeah. It's, uh, but you, you, you realize when you think you read about these people and how to what level this was considered uh, um, uh, something to replicate, something desirable, something to fear. Uh, and, and, and you realize how, how strange this sounds to us, how much we have changed, right? How much uh, um, our perception of reality has shifted. Uh, because this was something totally uh, pars- uh, parsable and uh, easy to understand for someone from medieval Europe, let's say. Uh, 2,000 years after after that Yusmus. But uh, only a few hundred years have passed since then, and this is totally impenetrable to us, right? It's completely alien. Um, it's, it's really strange. I think you, you hit on an interesting point there in terms of how we understand the world. And 
in in thinking about the, the stories that, that that you're sharing in in my knowledge of, of of warfare is much more based around popular culture, right? And thinking about how Hollywood has represented war, um, how how war is represented in novels, um, stories, comics. Um, it's not actually that far away. The, the, I'm, I'm thinking about narrative as a as an ordering principle for understanding these events we understand these heroic tales of self-sacrifice as a way of understanding the world um but i think this brings us up to to thinking about games and thinking about games relationship to warfare um the, these these are games are a technique i think of warfare um that are that are intertwined in in terms of how we understand war um yet the the what's what's interesting here and there is a link is that um when um so what seems what what seems to have happened in terms, in this shift is that uh that metaphysical level uh was displaced um it disappeared and uh that what Krishna was explaining to Arjuna as the uh, esoteric war, right? The war within, uh, within the self, was uh, completely displaced. And so, um, in, in, when I was thinking about where the line ends, it kind of ends with the end of medieval Europe. Uh, like if you read, if you read the most popular romances, which is the novels and pop culture of medieval Europe, they are all about uh, the internal war being uh, uh, dominating over the external war. They are usually, like, for example, um, you have this in the Song of Roland. Um, you have this in the story of the Grail. Right? The story of the Grail is really interesting because uh, it's about uh, not so much about conquest, but it's about spiritual uh, war within the self. Right? And it's interesting when this this kind of disappears and then uh, all that remains is the simulation of war. And that's where we are uh, when it comes to uh, games because um, we, have, uh, we have always simulated uh, war, like war games, always very important because they simulate uh, a war in space-time. To, Even uh, in training. Yeah, in, in, in training. And in they're always, you, could, you could do it in a very small scale, literally in a board game. Or you could do it in a huge scale, which is uh, mass uh, mass exercises, right? But it's always a simulation. And uh, war games have a re- also a really interesting pedigree, though, uh, especially table tabletop games and uh, the idea of the si- simulation of complex space-time maneuvers in a in a um, board game. But before we get there, I, I want to circle back a little bit around this notion of the the leader. And the the self sacrifice and, and and talk us through a little bit through two um, ancient games that we associate with not only war but territory mm-hmm. and control uh, and strategy specifically and that is both go and chess. What uh, interests me about the difference between those two is that one is maybe you might think of as a peasant army. Or uh, you know there there is no distinguishing characteristics between units or elements mm. in 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 Go, and in um, in chess you have very identifiable figures of um, authority control. Now those now chess is of, of of course much more ancient than the the, the game that we associate with modern chess. Um, the the introduction of the king, the queen, the bishop. Um, these figures happened in in around I think it's the fifteenth, sixteenth uh, in in Spain, fifteenth yeah. century in Spain. Before that, chess comes to us from from India through Asia, Persia. Yeah. Persia. Like it's there's, it's very different, but the, it still has the the recognizable black and white squares and and individual pieces have different types of movement, which is very important, I think, yeah. as well. Um, but it's not until uh, it's not until the the very late medieval, early what you might call classic or mm. modern, I guess, um, period that we get these um, uh, figures of, of authority. And I'm particularly thinking about the king because these are 
you are taught in chess very valuable figures yeah. that 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 you protect the you king. protect and you have to protect yeah. the king but at the same time one of the strategies to win chess is to put your valuable figures um, uh, like the queen or your bishop in danger and even sacrifice them in order to gain uh, a, a, an overall advantage and of course the queen is the most po- powerful figure in, in chess <laughs> the uh, do you know what's, what else is interesting is that, uh, to me at least, that um, uh, when comparing Go and chess is that uh, the, the way of winning, the algorithm, if you will, of winning uh, is vastly different. It, kind oh. of, you, it can be used to illustrate cultural differences and uh, uh, world perception. Um, so... Uh, um, for, like in chess, right? In chess, you, uh, your goal is to eliminate key figures uh, of the enemy and put, put the enemy in a situation where they are uh, checkmated, right? They are, um, they are, the king is uh, uh, destroyed. But notice the very technique of what, what checkmate is, is, is that it is, it's impossible to move or yeah. to take. There is no position. So it's all about position but perspective as well. And, and uh, the elimination of key uh, of figures. Whereas in uh, in Go, a war of attrition. It is a constant war of attrition, and the the uh, idea there is to eliminate all choice by encircling. Right, and so, so you you are uh, you are constricting the enemy's movements until the enemy cannot move at all, and that is when you win. Right, it's not doesn't matter at all whether you have taken all the figures or not, or how many figures you've taken. Right. Well, all that matters is that you've limited to, or rather, uh, extinguished their uh, choice. And, and this is this, as you say, is in, entirely resulting of, of cultural understandings of war, combat, strategy, politics. Mm. The, um, the 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 chess set, you know, t- taking the king head is is a very uh, predatorial, um, very aggressive understanding of, of how to do warfare. But Go is constriction. It's much more like the python, you know, stalking your prey, trying to encircle them and then squeezing them slowly rather than a, a strike at the, at the jugular or at the, or at the neck. To- two totally different frameworks for understanding conflict, understanding resources, understanding space, understanding even, I mean, no, they, they both take turns, which is quite interesting. So there's a, there's a similarity in, in temporal dimensions there. Uh, they both have a, a board that's based on a grid. There are some kind of core similarities that, that make those two games interesting in terms of how they understand war in time and space. Do you know what's interesting? There is no chance there. None there, whatsoever. There, yeah, yeah, luck is eliminated. Um, and this is interesting because if you look at the oldest board game that we know of, right, which uh, I'm, re- I'm kind of shouting back to our previous podcast when we talked about uh, the Shumerian world and uh, Enki and Asherah and uh, uh, um, the, the importance of Shumerian mythology. Um, the uh, Shumerians played a game called, uh, and now we call it the Royal Game of Ur because that's when uh, the game was discovered. We don't know how they called it. Um, but it was a game which was a little bit like uh, uh, so. It was a, a a little bit like go in the sense that you don't you you had a, a set number of figures that you had to move over and, and create a loop uh, on th- a board. I think the com- the most common comparison would be backgammon. Backgammon, yes, but uh, dice were involved as well. Oh yeah, and not only dice, four sided pyramid dice. Yes, um, so. Uh, there was a uh, uh, luck was uh, um, uh, essential part. Chance was an essential part in that, which I think is interesting because when you think of war and uh, um, how how war actually unfolds in the real world, there is always chance involved, right? Uh, it, there is always the element of unpredictability, which is interesting enough illuminated both in chess and in go. But returns in the modern era returns, of, of war games and big, board games, big time. So. Um, I, some of the earliest sets of um, uh, the Royal Game of Ur, I think, uh, like three thousand years before Common Era. Yeah, yeah it's five thousand years old. Yeah, three to f- yeah, yeah. Uh, and possibly even older than than that, which is amazing to think. And um, the, uh, it's the British Museum that has, I think, the oldest one. Mm. And um, uh, one of the the uh, archaeologists there have have recreated the rules from tablets. 
that were discovered. Yeah, that's how we know, actually. They discovered the tablet. This fascinating because we don't know how the game was called, but we know it's rules. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then let's return, let's return because we, we are going on a tangent yes. uh, again, as usual. But let's return back to, uh, to where it gets really relevant to, to the modern era. So we've kind of, we've touched on uh, the taxonomy of warfare and we have some sort of structure. We have, we touched on metaphysics and their uh, eradication from war uh, as it is practiced by modernity. And then we touched on the representation and simulation of war. And how can we bring all of this together? There is the example of uh, Kriegspiel, yeah. which the Prussians uh, started deploying as, a, as a, a simulation of war for the purposes of the general officer stuff. So Kriegspiel is basically German for a war mm. game. And uh, the first published rules were published in 1780 by Johann Helwig. And it was a chess variant mm. initially. Um, but... Um, it was a it was a reflection of the the way in which cartography was having a, a major impact on the understanding of how to plan for and conduct warfare. And so, um, rather than having a, 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 a abstract chessboard, Kriegspiel was played on a map. And this was a map of a territory, and it had elevation. Um, it, it, it also introduced random elements. You had dice mm. that you would roll, and so weather patterns could change. Um, uh, signals could get lost. Information could get distributed. So this was a, a, a much higher ordering of complexity of information and the representation of that in warfare. Uh, but as you, as you were saying earlier, Kriegspiel was taught uh, or was played e extensively in the officer training uh, of Prussian army, mm. um, uh, both both officers and um, non non officers. Mm. This was available uh, in small sets. The, the 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 officers and the generals had much more complex sets. There were entire tables with different pieces that that were conducted. But you could play it quite simply with with a few blocks of wood. Again, there's a a real abstraction he, here that represents that that transition from the the second generation to the third generation of of warfare. Um, there's a great line in a in a, um, a documentary on Kriegspiel that that um, argues that uh, Kriegspiel was so popular and influential it was it was credited as contributing to the Prussian victory uh, in the Franco-Prussian War. 1870, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but remember, this is that uh, um, standardization of the entire country into uh, something into a system preparing for a war is the birth of the modern state. It's, I think it's really important that all our listeners get that point. Uh, the modern state emerged in uh, in uh, 19th century Prussia as a reaction to the Napoleonic, uh, the, their defeats uh, in the Napoleonic warfare and reaction to the French Revolution. Um, and it sort of is, is the evolution of uh, the 18th century state into what we have today, which is a war machine. The state is a war machine first and foremost, and uh, uh, everything else uh, is, a, is a tertiary optional development. And we'll get into it, but the, the modern board game, the war game, is a, is a representation not only of war, but of the modern state and, and its organization. It, it's, it's um, for those of you that don't know Kriegspiel um, or kind of uh, war games, when you see uh, military leaders standing around a table with a map with, with um, miniatures. Yeah, figurines that they move. They yeah. move around yeah. and, and plot. That's basically Kriegspiel. Mm. And, and um, these kinds of war games are conducted at the the, to the top level of, of military planning and have done now for you know. Interestingly enough, now they're they're done by computers. Absolutely, uh, as yeah, a, as a virtual continuous simulation, virtual reality. There's a another um, development in war games in the early uh, or the late uh, 1800s, um, early 20th century, and that is of course toy soldiers. And H.G. Uh, Wells is, of course, famous for uh, his publication of, of science fiction novels. But H.G. Wells also um, created a different type of war game. 
And uh, he published a book in 1913 called Little Wars, a game for boys from 12 years of age to 150, and for that more intelligent sort of girl who likes boys' games and books. <laughs> That's the official <laughs> title. So Wells um, changes the, the nature of the, the war game from a, a tabletop experience to the floor. And where Kriegspiel orders um, the understanding of warfare from a kind of strategic top-down view, Wells introduces a, a, or formalizes, if you like, a much more romantic uh, view of play from the soldier's eye. And um, in the book, you are encouraged to push the furniture aside and set up your, your battlefield in your town with your soldiers and to get down at floor level and see the world through the soldier's eye. And this is, of course, it has to be contextualized that this is happening after the First World War, which was the first total war uh, to be experienced on the planet. Uh, and uh, it was a war where, uh, for example, the, the English would throw at Verdun Uh, 60,000 men to die within minutes. Uh, this was the kind of war uh, in the context of which uh, Wells is asking people to imagine war at, uh, at uh, ground level. But I, I, I view it as almost a kind of attempt to try and re, yeah, I, rehumanize. I, yeah, this, this, uh, what got me into thinking uh, about that is this word that you used, uh, he's romanticizing it. Um, because uh, he wasn't the only one. Uh, a lot of people at yeah. that time started uh, had, had this reaction of total revulsion to what was happening, like what they saw. And hence, after the First World War, there's this reaction across Europe that, you know, this is the last war. We won't have wars anymore because this, last was, great war. this was terrible. No, literally, like the League mm -hmm. of Nations, was started, yeah. what's now the United Nations, was started as a, as a uh, uh, you know, uh, an assembly to ensure that there will be no more wars of this type, right? Everyone agrees that the First World War was the, uh, horror personified and we won't have anything like that anymore. Of course, we all know what happened 20 years later. We had an even more grotesquely absurd war, um, uh, the Second World War. And... Um, uh, I view Tolkien actually. Yeah, I'm so glad you jumped. <laughs> I view Tolkien yes. uh, and The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings in the context of uh, both the first and especially the second. As you know, uh, he, he wrote The Lord of the Rings during the Second World War. Um, this is a reaction uh, um, of, again, this is my subjective uh, interpretation here, but I read this as a reaction of, of profound and utter disgust not only with war, but with modernity in its entirety, from A to Z, right? This is how I see The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. It's a complete rejection of this world. So I'm, I'm really glad you, you made that jump there because this is, this is the direction that I, I really wanted to, to think about um, in depth, and, and this is uh, the role of fantasy in regards to warfare, And the way, and 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 the role that that fantasy plays in our in our modern imagining and understanding of the way that we that we you know recognize ourselves um, and and our lives. It's 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 there's no it's not by chance that you know Game of Thrones became so popular. Not at all. Absolutely great example. And it's it and it's connected. Uh, to the same impulses that early fantasy writers were responding to, perhaps you know, as you say, that this this transition from second generation warfare to third generation and into fourth. Um, around the the turn of the last century, we see a number of authors um, writing not only in fantasy but in what's called weird fiction. Uh, Lovecraft, yeah. Yeah, we've got Lovecraft. Um, we've got Robert E. Howard, um, mm. who, you know, uh, is a contemporary of, of Lovecraft's. But we have uh, Lewis, mm. C.S. Lewis. Uh, he was uh, the, the best friend of Tolkien. Yes, and um, I haven't seen the Tolkien biopic, but there's a, a new biopic of, of oh, really? Tolkien. Yes. I didn't know. And is, was his son involved in that? I'm not sure. It, it had a very short run at the cinema. It was. It didn't. It didn't quite gain a lot of traction. But um, I'm hoping to to catch up on that. But as you were saying, Tolkien was writing about war, right? The end of the end of man, essentially in he's, he's, in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and he saw like when you re, when you look at uh, Sauron, 
uh, and the seduction of Saruman, what you're seeing is the um, and that's what the one thing I didn't like about the movies. By the way, the, the Lord of the Rings movies, in, in my opinion, uh, uh, this is cinema at its best. How it should be in heaven, uh, in in cinema heaven. That's probably what they're watching. But the, <laughs> I just I just don't like the the ending because it changes the ending from the book. And if you haven't read the the trilogy, the Tolkien wrote, the ending is really important because uh, after the final battle. Uh, everyone is happy and uh, they won. The hobbits return to the Shire to find that the Shire has been turned into a hellhole by Saruman. The scouring of the Shire. And it's turned into a hellhole by introducing all of these technologies, all these techniques that Saruman was introducing uh, uh, earlier in Rohan. And and so the, sh- the, the, the hobbits have to fight one more battle in order to defeat Saruman. And this is really important because it shows that... Uh, um, what, uh, in my opinion, this is where he really reveals his hand. It shows what he was really describing, what he was really against. Um, and that, of course, was uh, uh, the modern uh, world, as we know, the world of total war, the, the world of the uh, state as a war machine. It's it's really dark. That that last chapter in in Lord of the Rings is is so devastating because um, that idyllic lifestyle of uh, Hobbit of the Shire is gone yeah, forever. It's destroyed. And, and it, even even though they can rebuild afterwards, as you say, this introduction of new, these new technologies, the old ways of life are, are burnt down. That everything is everything is destroyed. And that's really important here because. Uh, many people make the mistake, I think many people who really mean well, into reading Tolkien as being against technology, which is, of course, totally not the case. Like the world of uh, the elves is the world of high technology. The world of men is a world of technology as well. The world of the dwarves is turbo technology when you think about that. What he is against is how technology is being used. Irresponsibility. Yes. And and that the and that totalizing impulse of Sauron, right, the impulse to conquer all and, and subjugate all, um, that that actually captures this this uh, irresponsibility. But why, Sa- and that's why Saruman is an even worse villain than Sauron. Sauron is the the kind of darkness in the heart of all men and all yeah. creatures. That's it's it's like the force of chaos. It, it's always there. You can't defeat it. But it's Saruman that commits the greatest. Um, treacheries. He goes against his order, whose duty is it to fight the darkness. He, go, he, you know, he's Saruman the White, and he he falls to um, the lures of of, of evil. Um, you know, he, and the he gains power through sacrificing the the trees at Isengard, and and it's it's just yeah, destroying destruction, uh, dis- yeah. destruction. And w- do you know what I uh, kind of I wanted to bring on as well? Notice how. Uh, Tolkien frame, he frames his characters. They, um, all the major protagonists are in their own way um, willing to, to, to perform the ultimate uh, the self-sacrifice, right? That's what Frodo does. Right? This is really important, right? Because uh, I read this as Tolkien trying to uh, re-inject the metaphysics into, into war and uh, re-inject that personal, the esoteric, uh, level, which is a level of the conquering of the self, because Frodo is full of fear, right? Frodo is full of doubt, uh, full of uh, uh, anxieties of all sorts, and then he has to overcome all of this, uh, um, and at the end be willing to to um, uh, uh, sacrifice himself, right? And he fails, right? he fails. If it's not for Sam to save him, he would have failed, right? Um, and it's the same with Aragorn, right? It's, it's- it's the same with Boromir, right? Yes, Bo- Boromir's Bo- yeah. redemption is a really important moment. Not 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 only his betrayal, but his redemption. He understands almost immediately that um, he would have misused the technology. He, it, it's not the technology's fault. It's that he desired to yeah. take the technology to his people, and he understands that he would have fallen to Isidore's trap as well. And it's in that moment where he stands up to those orcs and buys. Uh, Frodo time, time to yeah. escape yeah. That, that, that he's redeemed it's in that self-sacrifice and I think Frodo learns that and I think Sam learns that as well but as you say Frodo he fails he doesn't have that that strength for self-sacrifice he's already 
corrupted as Gollum was corrupted too far. Because it's a load to bear that he just wasn't meant to bear. So see, this is the thing. We're kind of reaching a, a key point here, I think, because what what is so obscene and evil about uh, uh, the way modernity performs war is, first, it's totalizing nature, right? Everyone, even the unwilling, has to be involved, uh, which is profoundly obscene, right? It's, it's a hor- horror. Um, and then the unwillingness on part of those who uh, orchestrate this to take uh, to to um, uh, take responsibility and take uh, uh, sacrifices of any sort. Right? It's always someone else's job to take to sacrifice. Right? Um, um, the the commodification of virtue as something to be shown to others. Right? Uh, conspicuous virtue. Right? Uh, like conspicuous consumption, uh, as opposed to something that is performed within, not to be shared with others. So this is really interesting, and I think uh, th- that's why uh, Tolkien's uh, trilogy uh, plus The Hobbit is so powerful and actually so subversive. It's, a, it's I think it's a full frontal attack against modernity. Um, and, and it's not accidental that it start, started an entire powerful genre. Beautiful. And this, this, this is important because it comes back to, to war games and the, and the way in which war games changed in, in the 1970s. So uh, following World War II, uh, the, the interest in war games um, picked up. It was, it was, mm. it was a small um, niche uh, market in war simulations. The company that, that produced this was called Avalon Hill, and they used what were called um, odds combat ratio tables that were developed in um, uh, 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 war planning. You know, it was a, a, a ratio tables of odds of what would happen in, in battles. And this was then adapted by, by Avalon Hill and in, in which you would have um, a tabletop game. It was usually um, a recreation of, a, of, a, of an important battle in World War Two, but also World War One. Sometimes ancient battles, and f- uh, miniatures would be abstracted as, as blocks of wood or markers, and you would roll dice to determine outcomes, and you would consult this this combat table. Uh, so this became very popular in the nineteen fifties. Avalon Hill was a, was a massive massive publisher. And, uh, of course, uh, by the 1970s, uh, there was a resurgence of interest in Tolkien and in fantasy in, in general. It's, it's interesting that the, the cyclical nature of, of, of genre um, is, is a couple of decades old. You know, we see it in the, in the, around the publishing of, of, of Lord of the Rings and it comes back in the 70s and I think it's come back again now in the 2010s. I won't be surprised, actually, uh, Probably one could make the argument that the, the, res, the resurgence or, or rather the rediscovery of fantasy as a genre in the late 70s and early 80s is tied to the profound crisis uh, in the West in the 70s, the recessions, etc., etc. And so we have a rejection of, of uh, reality again on, on a popular level. And so what was pulp considered peripheral pseudo-literature to this day, there are many people who would say that fantasy is pseudo literature. It's unbelievable to me that such people exist. Um, would uh, uh, suddenly became popular again, and then you have Hollywood discovering this and riding this trend, and you have the, a number of fantasy movies appearing. That's in the eighties. In in the in the seventies, um, we have this this important innovation, and it comes from Gary Gygax and and others. Um, and of course, I'm talking about Dungeons and Dragons. But before we get to Dungeons and Dragons, we're talking about chainmail. And uh, so Gygax and, and his friends um, and other groups at uh, places like MIT were playing these uh, miniature uh, recreations, these board games, and they got bored with the, the, the modernity notion of, of large armies or massed armies fighting against each other. And so they started to create um, fantasy Army. So rather than um, soldiers battling, you started to introduce fantastical elements, monsters, elves, dwarves, mm. orcs, trolls, tra- yeah. oh, trolls especially, a bit, of course, dragons. 
and um, it was um, oh, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna regret saying the name because I think I've got it wrong, but I think it's Dave Arneson. He created. Um, a mod, basically. So Gygax published Chainmail, which was a rule for fantasy battle armies. Arneson created a mod for this, which changed the focus from massed armies to individual figures. Again, doing what uh, Wells was kind of doing back in, in, mm. in with um, uh, Little Wars. But this was a this was a, a dramatic shift from from armies and mass tabletop armies to singular figures, usually. Uh, you know, a, a lone fighter like Conan the Barbarian uh, raiding uh, a dungeon or a castle and not always fighting your own way. The, other mods appeared where sometimes you would be a roguelike character and you would start to um, overcome challenges not based on fighting but avoiding fighting. So it's a dramatic shift so it's, in do, war games. Do you know what's really interesting? Because this shift is... Uh literally a return to a imaginary world of Bronze Age warfare, which was a, a warfare of and by heroes. Right? So this is literally Achilles versus uh, Hector in the Iliad, right? On the fields in front of Troy. Absolutely. Uh, and and the, the whole point became telling these stories through the, the warfield simulation. So there was still odds ratio tables. There was still dice, and we see the return of, to, of the Roman D20. Mm. We see a whole range of other dice to represent different um, uh, relationships between the, the, the size of the person, the weapon that they're carrying, the amount of movement they can do. It's still, it's still organized as a war game, but it is a, a fantasy-driven war game allowing people to have um, heroic elements. And this is where we see the introduction of things like hit points. We mm. see the introduction of levels. These are core gameplay mechanics that are still with us in the video game industry. And in fact, it's not just that, but it's the it's the organization of the narrative of the hero from, uh, you know, unknown... Um, blacksmith's son or, 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 or whatever to, to mighty, mighty hero. Yeah, notice that these are tropes, right? And these are tropes which have one thing in common, they're non-modern, right? It's a, it's a rejection of the uh, society and uh, um, worldview uh, which we uh, perforce inhabit today. Even when it gets modern, it gets demodernized, right? So it's steampunk, gaslight, all of these tropes are to, to demodern, uh, even um, Shadowrun, which is um, cyberpunk, but fantasized through elements of um, having introducing elves and dwarves and, again, orcs into this world. It's, it's demodernized. Do you know what? See, because we keep repeating this word, and, uh, and I have a feeling that m many of our listeners are probably wondering what, what does this actually mean in practice, demodernize. And the best way to illustrate this is when you think of how warfare operates today, just the horror, um, and how we've been configured to think about it and normalize that this is how war should be. And uh, I was even recently, I was uh, reading um, about the Crusades um, and uh, famous, I mean, there, there are many, many, many such examples. This, this one that is uh, quite famous when it comes to Saladin, the, the um, Muslim ruler, uh, who um, uh, lived at the time of uh, the Third Crusade and uh, um, who reconquered Jerusalem for Islam from the from the Crusaders? Um, and after the Battle of Hattin, in which he defeated the Crusaders, so the Crusaders, uh, uh, the Crusader state in uh, Palestine, uh, in total disarray, and so he starts besieging castle after castle and retaking them. And so we have this one case where he, there is a castle. And uh, he's besieging it with his army. And inside the castle is, uh, uh, again, a crusader with his um, uh, family and then his son who is uh, getting married. And so, uh, and this is a true story, by the way. You can check it out. And so his son is getting married. And so in the middle of this uh, fierce siege, there is a wedding. And so the, the people from the castle are sending a message to Saladin that, you know, uh, let's stop the war for a while because we have a wedding here. <laughs> And then he stops. They stop. And then there is a wedding and Saladin gets invited. 
And then he gets offered cookies, etc., and, and food, and you know everyone celebrates. Okay, done. We celebrated the wedding. It's all good. So let's go back to war. And, so, <laughs> and there are many stories like that, right? So you, you have a. It, when you think about it, you can you can laugh. It's like a story from a fantasy book, which is completely unbelievable. It it, it sounds like a fantasy, and and it's, so it's it's interesting that that fantasy becomes. Uh, popular in the, in the 1970s, um, particularly following the, the Vietnam War, uh, and then you see the rise of the sword and sorcery movie in the 1980s. And um, I've got a couple here that are some of my favourites that I, I just want to I want to mention: um, Dragon Slayer, um, Excalibur. Oh, Excalibur is such a good movie. Oh. It's, it's basically the return of the Arthurian myth in uh, in popular culture. Everyone should watch his caliber. Conan the Barbarian. Everyone has to watch yeah, Conan, Conan the Barbarian. Like, the first one. The first oh, one. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about the first one. The second one, one yeah. is abysmal, but the first movie is uh, astonishingly good. The second one is um, a, an artifact of the, 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 the investment in sword and sorcery movies as a commodity rather than as... Um, a, a narrative way of telling stories like like the horror genre the fantasy genre and the action genre in the 80s they were they were they were cheap to produce and it wasn't about the quality it was about the the quantity um red sonia red also, sonia, yeah. also falls into that you know it was potentially a great story um death stalker is of course a a, a legendarily bad movie and if you are uh, if you enjoy bad movies um, Deathstalker is one of the, one of the best. Highlander, I remember Highlander. Highlander is different again. Right? Highlander is much more in the Excalibur, Conan the Barbarian. But do you know what I think? I think Highlander was is actually. Uh, I mean, I'm probably overcomplicating it. Probably, I'm surely overcomplicating. But uh, it's a postmodern take on what is actually a non-modern uh, canvas. Because uh, Highlander is about different heroes who are uh, basically mortal, right? Um, and both men and women who are immortal. But the important thing is that um, they are immortal, um, which is which is beside the point, right? The the heroes of old are all mortal. Yeah. And like if you look at the story of Achilles, uh, they they are all human, profoundly human, right? and they all struggle knowing that they will fail, but still fight on and struggle, right? Uh, um, which is which is the heroic. This is what the heroic is in its essence. And you can see this uh, reappearing, uh, reappearing again and again in, in traditional myth and traditional tropes, and it's reappearing in Tolkien, right? That's what he injects so forcefully. And the Highlander kind of uh, uh, flicks this away yeah. because we have immortals and it's so cool, right? Do you know what captures it, though? He Man and the Masters of the Universe. Now, He Man and the Masters of the Universe is is endlessly um, uh, uh, torn down because it was uh, Mattel, uh, I think it was Mattel, um, selling toys. Um, you know, GI Joe mm-hmm. was popular at the time. Transformers was popular at the time. So this was a line of toys, but the the transmedia behind it, the comics, the the cartoons, uh, and even the the movie in in eighty seven. Is much more like uh, the stories of Ulysses and, and Odysseus, and it's much more about uh, human heroes that get access to great power um, and great artifacts of power, but they are working as you know as a group. It's not. I mean, He Man is of course the mm. is of course the the Achilles of the, of the time, but it is it is still about a group of people work, working together to free their country from. Uh, skeletal, right? <laughs> mm. it, it was just a, another Sauron figure, um, although possibly a more Sauron man. Um, the last movie I, I, I want to mention um, is Willow, and, and that's another underrated. Willow Upgood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but again, that's the, that's the story of... What uh, was it? The, the evil reign of Queen of Morda. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched this movie so many times. <laughs> and I, I like that movie because um, magic fails so often. In that one, it's magic is often seen as uh, the Deus Ex Machina, but it's, um, yeah, in in many respects, it's a it's a kind of a, a take 
uh, uh, reinterpretation of uh, uh, Lord of the Rings because, of course, we have uh, Willow acting as Frodo here and uh, you know, the, uh, you know d- delivering the coup de gras at the end where all uh, proper heroes fail, right? So the proper heroes fail and then you have the, the person who is definitely not a hero uh, uh, on the surface turning out to be the, the person with the, the strength to to, uh, to overcome to that overcome. internal battle. Yes. Yeah. Which is so often just simply characterized as overcoming cowardice, but that's that's such a simple way of understanding that that battle. This brings us um, to the origins of those quotes that I was talking about at the at the start of, of the podcast, which is the the creation of Warhammer fantasy battles. Um, which was created by Rick Priestley for Games Workshop in in 1983. The first edition of, of Warhammer Fantasy was in 1983, and it, what's really interesting about this the fantasy battle universe or mythology is that it was actually ended in 20, uh, 2010. At the end of eighth edition, there was a, a, a campaign that was published, and in it. The old world, which is the world of of men and the alliance with the dwarves and the elves, succumbs to the to the literal forces of chaos and the undead. Um, the, the 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 chaos forces put, uh, pour out of the the chaos portal in the north. The undead and the skaven and the um, tomb kings, the the mm. Egyptian undead, overrun the world, and the world is destroyed. It is ended by the forces of chaos. It's, it's actually quite a remarkable um, intellectual property in that. It was rebooted later, but in a very different way. Remember that uh, this is... So one of the big differences here, uh, and I'm kind of jumping deep into myth, but this is, this is a direct uh, uh, reimposition and retake of um, the ancient uh, Indo-European uh, mythology and um, which is known in the West, for example, through the example of Nordic mythology and Ragnarok, right? But uh, the death of the gods and the end of the world um, is is a primary uh, trope in, in ancient Indo-European mythology. And uh, uh, key moment, though, this is the necessary precondition for the restarting of the cycle, right? Because the understanding of time is cyclical. And so... Um, uh, what, for example, is not mentioned in uh, uh, in modern takes of, of uh, Nordic mythology is that uh, Ragnarok and the end of the gods and the cleansing, the ending of the cycle, is a necessary precondition for the beginning of the new, where the kids, the children of the gods, restart the world, and and the world begins a new, a fresh world, right? In a new golden age, dawns, right? Um, this is when you have that in in Warhammer and kind of. Uh, I find very interesting that, you know, you have the world is ending and the new world has to begin, right? We get a little bit of this in the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe with Thor Ragnarok, which is the end of Asgard. Um, And the the survivors uh, of that cataclysm, um, they get attacked by Thanos and half their population is destroyed. And so the remnants end up on Earth Mm -hmm. and they they rebuild... um, um, uh, Asgard as a as a small fishing village. Mm. <laughs> it's not the same kind of poetic, but there there is there is an element of that in in the MCU. This I think is is a useful um, segue uh, because I'm I'm conscious of time, but uh, to start talking about Total War, uh, Total War series. This the the game series started by the Creative Assembly. Um, in 1999, yeah. um, Creative Assembly was an English company, mm-hmm. and it was initially backed by Electronic Arts, and they made sports games to start with. Yeah, but they made their money and name uh, with uh, with the Total War series, which was, you know, initially it was a, a Shogun Total War, uh, which came out in 2000. I was surprised by that. I thought medieval Total War was the first, but it was actually no. Shogun, which is a, a, a retelling of the Japanese Edo period. So it was no, it was no. the beginning of the Edo period. So beginning. It, it was the the gigantic uh, uh, civil, civil war um, that uh, uh, lasted in in Japan for 
a few centuries that uh, was ended by the victory of Tokugawa Ieyasu and movement of the capital to Edo, which is now called Tokyo, and um, uh, with the capital of the Tokugawa clan, right? And uh, so this is, you're inserted in that period of, of uh, strife and civil war, and your role is to unify uh, Japan, what, uh, which is what Tokugawa Ieyasu did. What's really important about the Total War series is that it brings together the uh, strategic bird's eye view, the um, the somewhat abstracted level of warfare that we see in Kriegspiel and board games. Yeah, so this with war is management. Yes, yeah. Well, yeah. So that's one part of the game, but it also then switches over when you enter into a battle into a real-time strategy game and you are on the battlefield and you have to control units in real time, uh, much more like the uh, Dungeons and Dragons, mm. much more like the Little Wars. So it is a t- Total War is a really interesting game that kind of brings together these two understandings of, of time and space and understandings of war in, in this remarkable package. And I think that's why it resonates for both of us, but in different ways. Yeah, because what for me what's really interesting about uh, Total War series is that it's, um, uh, it's the most successful so far um, the insertion of uh, diff- different historical periods into a game environment. And there have been many... Uh, what are known as strategy games, um, either turn-based or real-based, uh, real, uh, real-time strategy games, which uh, um, obviously operating in different historical periods. But Total War is uh, uh, apart, a basically, a quality apart from from them all because of that mixture of uh, the bird's eye um, management level uh, and uh, and the real. Uh, a kind of tactical uh, level of, of uh, an actual battlefield where you can be at the eye view of uh, and, uh, and adopt a, uh, a point of view of, uh, of a soldier or of a unit as they clash with another unit. I mean, those of you that, that, that know games, um, you know, might um, might know Civilization as mm. as a as a strategy game that that, that manages the 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 state of war. Uh, Age of Empires, also, Age of yeah. Empires, yeah. which is yeah, yeah, is Age of Empires real time? Uh, it's real time, yeah. So that has the yeah. that has the real time in it, mm-hmm. in it, but but Total War is the only one that brings these two together. And what was also very very important about Total War was that it was historically accurate, and the historical accuracy was uh, uh, fetishized by uh, the players and by uh, the Creative Assembly when they were positioning the games to to an audience because you knew that you would be dealing with uh, accurate uh, place names, accurate uh, population, uh, um, uh, often uh, language, um, uh, you know, things like uh, the different, uh, the clothing, the banners people would be would be uh, carrying, uh, the names of generals, uh, you know, uh, uh, enormous intricacy of detail was of historical detail was inserted in these games, and uh, and it's kind of culminated. So we started. You, we had uh, first uh, Shogun, then we had Medieval, which was a, a European game. We had uh, Rome, which was a European antiquity, um, and then uh, we had uh, Medieval Two, which, which is was probably the pinnacle of the series uh, for historical accuracy. Bec- yes, I. Completely agree with that, and uh, also because uh, it was a game that uh, um, was purposefully uh, left open by the developers for modders to uh, add even further um, uh, historical uh, detail and to to adapt to all sorts of different uh, environments. So, for example, the uh, Medieval Two Total War game allows players to 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 start. I forgot already how many, but you know you have the major European countries from the medieval period appearing there. Uh, but models were recreating it for tiny principalities in uh, Central Europe, let's say, or somewhere in Eastern Europe or in the Balkans or in uh, um, Asia Minor um, uh, or, or in North Africa, for that matter, which, uh, uh, you know, obviously the developer would not uh, would not uh, have the resources to cover. So, um, and after that, the Warhammer universes uh, merges with with Total War. But it's a continuation of this logic. One of the reasons why, so so medieval 
2 comes out in 2006, and that's after the acquisition of Creative Assembly by Sega. Um, and then it's not it's not for another 10 years. There's, there's a series of other games, of Total War games. Um, Empire was, 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 was one. But Total War Warhammer comes out in, in 2016. But it is this attention to detail that makes it so successful. It is a, a, a total recreation. You might say a historical uh, accuracy, but I guess a fictional accuracy. So much of this attention to detail um, is is lovingly and painstakingly replicated in the the Total War engine, and it is a it is a, a remarkable translation of the tabletop experience. And one of the reasons why the game was so successful is that it it it. Um, like Gary Gygax, like like Chains, Chainmail, it, it um, and, and moving into Dungeons and Dragons, it allows for the tabletop experience to take on entirely new dimensions. And again, uh, you know, for example, we're just cost prohibitive. Um, the, the the size of the armies, for example, the size of the figures, the detail on the figures. Warhammer was very much a hobby. Um, in, in fact, many hours would be spent painting and collecting, assembling and making the armies. Probably a kind of a, a, an order of 10 to 20 to, to 1 where where you would spend this immeasurable amount of time building these these armies. So... What's really important here is to to kind of uh, return us to the to the major main canvas that uh, we started with is that uh, you have this universe, uh, the fantasy universe, um, which is operating on these principles uh, that we already covered. It's a it's a um, kind of symbolic rejection of modernity, um, and that's one. And uh, and it has its own uh, uh, it, uh, internal logic and it's internally coherent. And then um, uh, the other aspect here is that you have that um, mixture of the um, uh, in terms of the, the stages that we we uh, encountered. You have that mixture of um, the lines clashing um, and uh, the element of uh, management. Uh, which is, you know, the opportunity to um, immerse yourself in a world and perform this world because this is what the real time or, or even turn, turn-based strategy games are. Uh, it's it's an immersion of the in, into the performativity of the world, right? So as you are enacting this world, because it the world will not move anywhere without you enacting it. And this is this is why the game is so interesting because it seems to blend together all the different generations of of warfare in one simulation, one coherent package. You do have these massed armies of With, lions. Sorry, without the fort. Yeah. Uh, um, you, you, and you you can to an extent enact mass mobility warfare. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I, I can speak from the fantasy because that's, that's where I've spent my most of my time because some of the armies are just masses. Some of the armies like the, the dwarf, no, sorry, the, the orcs, um, the, the skaven, which are rat men, mm. are just, they're just mass armies and you, you just try to overcome your opponent through sheer numbers. Others are highly technical like the dwarves. Dwarves are... M- very few troops, super highly armoured, massive siege, massive siege weapons, cannons, fire, flowing, you know, even even helicopters. It's it's a, it's an odd fantasy universe of this. No way. It's but uh, you have you have this uh, uh, te- technical artifact. See, the important thing here is that uh, f- you often see this actually in the literature. People rejecting fantasy as a um, as a genre. Uh, based on the illusion that fantasy is somehow a denial of uh, uh, technology, right? It is not. It has never been. Magic is just a, a, yeah. a particular type of technology. Yeah. So uh, you have that. But I'm also thinking of the, that heroic element that we talked about. Um, to what extent would you say it's present in, in this? Uh, now, this is, this is really interesting because I think one of the things that, that you might dislike about the, the, the modern era of uh, total War is the emergence of heroes and the, and the focus on heroes. So heroes totally have totally disrupted Total Total War in the game, um, and this happens in particularly in the first 
um, Total War Warhammer, but also in the sequel, which came out in 2017, in which there's a much bigger emphasis on heroes, and they have a huge impact on the game. Remember, though, what's interesting here is that they're not actually – they're superheroes. Yeah, well said, yes. They are not – Yes. they are not human. No. And that's the thing. That's the big jump. So uh, unfortunately, yes, right. it's, you, you could look at it as a, as a sort of uh, They're gods. diminishment or degeneration of imagination because yeah. uh, in that traditional view that we, we were talking about, uh, the hero is always a human. Yeah. Right? And what is more, a human who, who knows uh, that they're mortal and they will fail, right? There's no out here. Yeah. There's no winning. <laughs> It, it was unfortunate for the for the game because um, the these heroes were cheap DLC, so this was a, a, a monetization effort, and that totally changed the way the game played. Um, when the the tabletop battle, you often had a figure that you painted up that was that was your you know your general, yeah. but even your even in your individual uh, rank and file troops, you had specific figures that you would spend more time on painting, and they were your they were your um, your commanders. the The latest version of Total Warfare is Three Kingdoms, and that's taken on this godlike in, in a Chinese uh, yeah, context, yeah. Which I mean, from a historical oh, it's fantastic that they did that. It's just that uh, they they went exactly that way where they uh, they've they've created this gigantic uh, uh, um, peasant armies commanded by gods uh, by gods yeah um, and, and 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 even to the point where the armies will stop fighting and watch two gods clashing yeah. on the battlefield it's lost that historical um, oh am I gonna am I gonna pronounce this verisimilitude yes. Uh, definitely, he's lost that, and I'm curious though why why is why is this even a trope? What do you think? My my view is that it's all about monetization and it's all about the success of League of Legends and Dota, yeah, um, yeah. and the focus on the 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 the, the supernatural godlike heroes and their powers. And um, that becomes just a simple way to make a lot of money on DLC. Uh, you know, FIFA has been problematized by this, where you have to collect the star cards. It's just the monetization of the industry. Yeah, it's com- commodity, yeah. commodity fetishism yet again. Um, do you know what I'm reminded of? I'm reminded of um, uh, the song of Roland, which was, for those of you who are not familiar, the song of Roland was the definitive text of uh, knighthood in medieval Europe. Uh, so if you were uh, uh, a knight or a young uh, um, uh, boy or girl who was preparing because women uh, um, were uh, very often also um, knighted and won knights, um, you, you, this would be your book, the book that, uh, the, uh, the story that you would be reading, The Song of Roland. And uh, Roland was a knight of uh, uh, Charlemagne, Charles the Great, the emperor who unified the Franks. And uh, the song of Roland is actually the song of his defeat and death. And that's really powerful. Yeah. And, and why I'm returning to this, because uh, this is the essence of that Indo-European m- mythos of the hero and it kind of touches it so well. So Roland volunteers to self-sacrifice and cover the retreat of the emperor's army from uh, they, they are they are cap- they are basically attacked in this mountain pass by uh, by an enemy. Uh, this, which the enemy is, by the way, mo- the modern Basques. This is in northern Spain, in the uh, in uh, the Pyrenees between Spain and France. And so uh, uh, Roland volunteers to stay behind alone and cover up the retreat of uh, the emperor's army, uh, so knowing full well that he would uh, he would be killed. And so he gets, he is killed, and uh, he's mortally wounded, rather. And so the song of Roland is the song that he sings as he's dying, and the song that he sings to his uh, uh, horse and to his sword, right? Um, uh, I forgot the name of uh, the horse. The, I remember the name of his sword, Durandao, because every true knight would always name his sword or her sword. So... Um, he, he's singing to his sword. And what's interesting here is this, that he's, um, 
he is the song is actually a joyful song um, of uh, a life well lived and a, a debt well earned, uh, even though it's a debt in defeat. Right? You are uh, on the exoteric level on the outside. You were you 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 were killed. Right? You didn't win. Um, but on the esoteric level, it's a profound victory. Right? And this is what the song celebrates. And Roland dies really happy that he has achieved that profound victory, uh, telling this to his sword because there's no human around him to which he can sing. And I'm reminded of this when I'm thinking of how we've kind of misrepresented heroes today. Yes. I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, of the superhero um, but it's there's there's a there's a, uh, a kind of hierarchy and ordering of, of superheroes um, in which you have gods, um, Thor, um, being of course the, the classic, uh, and then you have a, a kind of demigods like um, you know Captain America and and Iron Man, but then you have the kind of street level heroes. Which are always more interesting, yeah, because they are because they're real. They're they're real. Um, they're also not billionaires, so you know, Batman yeah. would be a, yeah. would be a demigod. Uh, they're just um, people who maybe have found some sort of calling, um, maybe have some slight advantage that helps them do what they're doing, but they're fighting, um, you know, thugs and you know, mm. gangs and, and trying to trying to make life better for people uh, on the street. Um, you know, I'm thinking like Daredevil and even Spider-Man. I kind of I have a, a fondness for Spider-Man because he uh, fails all the time. S- sorry to interrupt. No, no. Do you remember uh, Rorschach from Watchmen? Yes, yes. So uh, in my I imagination, mean, this nuts, is what Rorschach is. Yeah. Right? He's actually a, an ordinary person. Uh, well, it, it, totally. Yeah. I mean, he he is insane, but he's he's just an ordinary person that decides that he's not going to put up with the insanity. So his his battle is is against his internal insanity, yeah, insanity. but he's not going to let that stop him from uh, trying to prevent the world from falling to to chaos. And he knows he's going to lose, yeah. But and it's a matter of time until he's going to lose. But he's going to fight that battle. And, both internally and externally, until he does lose. And he does lose. Uh, it would be interesting to see, um, I think it's Amazon that have the, the new Watchmen series um, in which there's a, a kind of, I think, I haven't read the comics, but um, I read the original Watchmen, but in, in the series I think there's like a legion of raw sharks, people that put on the mask, a lot like V for Vendetta. Uh, when everyone, yeah, everyone is wearing a mask. So everyone's everyone wearing is, a mask, and uh, and you have so this is of, the, one of the reasons why anonymous is a fascinating phenomenon. And Vivo Vendetta, I thought, was a really powerful uh, story. Is uh, this that actually true heroism is uh, in many respects anonymous? Um, oh, absolutely! And because the battle is internal. Right? That's is this this trope that we're returning to. Uh and that's the the sacred battle is in the internal one. And th- that the uh the external one that we associate with war is uh, the profane uh battle. Right? Uh, the 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 battle that can be machinic, can be uh automated, uh, and and the battle that is always h- horrible, where the horror is. Right, you remember that's uh, that line from uh, uh, Apocalypse Now, the horror, the horror. Right, so this is this is that battle, uh, and it's um, and and we see it's the, it's perverse stage today when we're observing uh, drones being used to kill innocent people, right? Uh, people living in fear from uh, uh, machines, which uh, um, uh, you know operated remotely, and and we call this war today. And I, I think this is this is probably leading us to a, to a conclusion. But this is why uh, war games are so important. It, and uh, take me back. It takes me back to that that point I was trying to make is that earlier on that that, that war games aren't training us for war. 
but providing us with situations in which we can fight that internal battle to even though you know, we have things like save games and difficulty mm-hmm. settings there, there is still um, the it, the war game provides us with the situation to test our ability to overcome that internal battle. It's a it's a battle with yourself. Um, and and um, Total War, the, the the Creative Assembly game, is is an example for mm. this. Right? It is it is the chance to to recognize the mistakes you've made in the past, to uh, frame your your mental. Um, your mental uh, approach to the game and to steal yourself to 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 not make the same mistakes you made last time and try and achieve victory do you know what i uh, how i often play total war and and let's and let's uh, kind of approach the finish line as it were um because you can play uh, depending on you know you, you start with a certain country or a certain faction and you can play very aggressively trying to attack other countries and conquer territory um, or you can uh, uh, defend peace to the last, as it were. I often uh, like to play, in fact, most of the time, in, in a way where I uh, uh, refuse to attack any country uh, or any other faction and uh, just keep keep developing my own faction. And so all my wars are defensive uh, wars. And it's fascinating because the, the game allows you to operate in all of these different modalities. I, I think you would like um, uh, uh, Warhammer, the first game, because the campaign is about s- preparing for the onslaught of chaos. Mm. Chaos descends from the north. And there is a, a very heavy emphasis on diplomacy at higher levels of difficulty. Unless you have... Um, brokered the peace between the elves and the dwarves and you've allied with the dwarves and allied with the elves um, and and possibly quelled the insurrection of the undead in the south, you're not going to be prepared for that, uh, for that uh, onslaught. onslaught. And so it is a very defensive um, game and it tests you, right? Because your your um, some of your who you think will be allies, like the border princes, will attack you, and the Bretonians will attack you, and and it's a lure. It's to, it's to pull you into that trap of engaging in a in a war that will sap your forces, so that the chaos can then march over you. But if you can hold the line and you can withstand those invasions and broker the peace between them, you are then ready for that surge so yeah. when, when chaos comes. But of course, they they don't stop coming even like it's just wave after wave after wave and it it prompts you into then eventually having to take over but it's it's um exactly that but it's it's the stealing of the self it's not necessarily the battle that you that you that you are learning how to fight well because the real-time strategy is a is a game of rock paper scissors you know essentially you have to learn what defends against what you know when to strike with your cavalry when to withdraw mm. like there's 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 that technique but there's also that inner battle of how to become the the lord of your nation and and withstand the forces railed against you and do you know what's and uh that's the, the last thing i wanted to say and, and i think it's really time for for us to stop but do you know what kind of this reminds me of in the iliad there is this interesting, uh, and it's actually a brilliant uh, uh, s- storytelling uh, tactic deployed by Homer when he compares the heroiz- heroism of uh, Hector, who is uh, a human, uh, and, uh, and Achilles, who, as we know, has a demigod mother, and um, a nymph mother, actually. And so uh, and he's impervious to, to weapons, right, uh, apart from his heel. And so... Um, and and then you have this, uh, and the heroism of Hector is so much more real. And Achilles becomes real only when he realizes the inhumanity of, uh, so after he kills Hector and he desecrates the body, which mm. is the, the, uh, the ultimate sin in, in the Indo-European uh, tradition. So um, he realizes uh, the horror of w- how the kind of war he has been fighting when uh, Hector's father comes begging for the body of his son and crying um, and offering himself as a sacrifice if the body of his son could be returned. And so Achilles then starts crying, realizing 
um, uh, that his uh, his only way out here is to become human again, right? And and so he actually sacrifices himself at the end to um, to be, in order to become human and redeem himself as a real hero, right? And he becomes a real, and he remained a real hero in in uh, um, in Greek uh, mythology. So. Um, with that, I just wanted to restate the title of this podcast uh, on which we settled because it kind of really captures uh, what we were talking about. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll just uh, restate the, the part that I think is the, uh, really powerful. Thus, all life is a struggle against chaos, a struggle that is ultimately destined to be lost. Albrecht of Nuln. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at CL underscore more. And you can find me on Twitter at uh, Ted Meet you. Uh, Thank you all for listening and uh, see you online.